When the American Revolution broke out, patriots from the 13 colonies fought against the British Empire for their independence. Sometimes overlooked was the help the patriots received from the French and the Spanish, who lent thousands of troops as well as their navies to help. But just to the north, most of the people there, in the newly conquered New France, refused to rise up against the British and join the revolution. Why? The short answer is, they were better off sticking with their conquerors than siding with the Americans. But why? Why were the cruel British a better bet for the French Canadiens than freedom-loving Yanks? To understand the dynamics at play, we have to go back two decades before the American Revolution, before New France was conquered by Britain. On the eve of the French and Indian War, zooming into this place here, the Ohio Valley, we can see that it was claimed by the French, whose merchants were trapping beavers and trading with the indigenous peoples of the area. However, many of the British settlers from the neighboring colonies like Pennsylvania and Virginia did not like having the French in their own backyard, and insisted on expanding westward. Basically, when land got too crowded and expensive, people moved west looking for cheaper land to farm. Kinda how when the city and its suburbs get too expensive, people move further and further out. Except with horrendous acts committed against the native peoples. This friction between the British settlers moving west, and the French and indigenous peoples there, led to both sides exchanging atrocities and destruction until war was inevitable. The French and Indian War broke out in 1754. Two years later, grumblings in Central Europe saw Great Britain and France formally declare war and go all out during the Seven Years' War, sometimes called the First Global War, since it was fought in Europe, North America, South America, Africa, and Southeast Asia. The French colony of Canada, yes, that's what it was called, based in Quebec City, was vastly outnumbered by the British colonies along the Atlantic. At the outbreak of the war, the 13 colonies had over a million colonists, whereas the French colony of Canada had about one-tenth of the population, but it was spread out over a much larger area. This meant that defending this half-continent-sized colony would require a massive investment of troops and resources from Europe, which the French king just didn't seem willing or capable of making. Quebec City was the most strategically important city in Canada, since that's where the reinforcements and supplies would have to land. In order to be able to take it, though, the British Navy would have to sail around Cape Breton Island on its way there, which was challenging due to the French forces stationed at the fortress at Louisbourg. So they had to focus there first. In 1758, the British Admiralty annihilated the French fortress of Louisbourg on Cape Breton Island. But don't worry guys, it was partially rebuilt in the 60s and 70s, and is now a National Historic Site, so, you know, th there's that. This gave the British control of the mouth of the St. Lawrence. The following year, in one of the most consequential engagements in Canadian history, British General James Wolfe defeated the French forces led by Louis-Joseph de Montcalm on the Plains of Abraham outside the walls of Quebec City. Both leaders were mortally wounded in battle, but ultimately the French would surrender the fortress. After an unsuccessful attempt to regain the city, the French fell back to Montreal. This respite proved short-lived when, in 1760, Montreal, the last domino in New France at that time, fell. New France was finished. The peace treaty officially transferred the land, except for these small islands over here, to Great Britain. The French colony of Canada was reorganized into the new, now British colony of the province of Quebec, and was mostly restricted around the St. Lawrence River, including Quebec City and Montreal. Oh 
yeah. After years of war against their foes, the settlers in the 13 colonies got excited. Here we go. Virginia, Pennsylvania, New York, even Connecticut and Massachusetts with their ludicrous land claims, they were all about to get everything they ever dreamed of. Except, no. Despite winning the war, King George III proclaimed that the land west of the Appalachian Mountains was to be a native reserve and forbade all settlement beyond the mountain chain. As a result, many in the 13 colonies felt betrayed that they had fought for land that they were now being denied the right to colonize. Now don't get me wrong, the government wasn't stopping westward settlement because they cared about the indigenous peoples. This was in response to an armed conflict with the indigenous peoples who didn't approve of the British presence in the Great Lakes region. Despite the British's heinous use of biological warfare during the so-called Pontiac's War, they weren't able to break the indigenous population. Faced with the choice of needing to send in more, expensive reinforcements, or limiting the British settlement in the region for the time being, the British, broke and buried alive by the debts of the Seven Years' War, decided to negotiate a peace and enforce a no-settlement zone. More territorial expansion would have to wait until the books read a little less like a horror story. I don't know if modern-day Brits or Americans can relate to the economic burden of waging war halfway across the world. To dig themselves out of this pit, London decided that it would be swell to tax the colonists to pay for the war effort. This made sense, since defending the colonies from the French and their indigenous allies was the official cause of war in North America. Why shouldn't the colonists have to pay up? Unfortunately, Fox News wasn't around yet to tell them that Americans don't like paying higher taxes or paying the quarter troops to defend them, especially since they don't have a say in the legislature that's levying their taxes. No, don't look at Washington, D.C. Double standards are okay now. Anyway, one thing leads to another, which leads to another, yada yada yada, and we get the Boston Tea Party in December 1773, the culmination of a decade of the deteriorating relationship between colonists and crown. In response, the British ended Massachusetts' local government, took control of the Boston port, and raised taxes. Again. Somewhat unrelated, they also passed the Quebec Act 1774, which formally annexed a huge swath of land, particularly in the Ohio Valley, into the province of Quebec, not into any of the unruly 13 colonies. This effectively rendered worthless the land claims bought from any of the colonial governments for land in what is now the Midwest and Ontario. This despite the colonial government's belief that their charters gave them claims over these lands. Instead, their promised land was gifted to their former enemies, the ones they had literally just fought to pry the land off of. In one sense, the French and Indian War was fought between the British and the French empires, but at the micro level, it was a conflict that pitted the British settlers against the French settlers. And now the losers were given back their land claims. That's not how war is supposed to work, said every colonist from Boston to Richmond. By the way, take a second to imagine Detroit once again being a part of Quebec. Even more horrifying to the Patriots about the Quebec Act 1774 was how it expanded the acceptance of the French language over the new territory and strengthened the power of the French nobles living there. It also guaranteed free practice of the Catholic faith all over the newly expanded Quebec as well as strengthening the Catholic Church's role in society. It also de jure restored the use of French civil law for private affairs. To this day, Quebec still uses their civil code, which is why three out of the nine judges on our Supreme Court have to be from Quebec, so the court will be sufficiently knowledgeable with the Quebec civil code. That and the fact that Quebec is Quebec and they are special and we should not rock the boat or they will threaten to divorce us. Again. To those living in the 13 colonies whose memories of fighting the French were etched into their brains, watching the government in London give so much to their former enemy as well as the Catholic Church felt like a slap in the face. So put yourselves in the shoes of a colonial in New York the year before the revolution. Your neighbor, Massachusetts, just lost their local government. You cannot expand westward because those lands have just been given to your enemy, which, by the way, doesn't even have an elected assembly at all. It's just led by an unholy alliance between the British Crown, French nobles, and the Catholic Church. 
all of a sudden you and many others like you see that the British are clearly trying to roll back democracy in the colonies and chances are your local government is going to be next on the chopping block. Forget representation in London, you're going to lose representation on this side of the Atlantic too. Even if that might not have happened, it certainly didn't stop the Patriot press from demonizing the French and Quebec for political gain. I know this sounds weird, but try to imagine Americans demonizing other cultures for political gain. At this point I should probably note that Canadians have done the same things too, but being smug towards our neighbors to the south is kind of a large part of our national identity so we're just gonna ignore that. Such was the contempt for the embiggened Quebec that the First Continental Congress formally condemned the Quebec Act for establishing a Catholic colony without a representative government right beside the 13 colonies, describing it as a tyranny and complaining about how their resources were spent conquering the lands from France but not given to them. Wait, I thought, I thought they weren't paying taxes. The First Continental Congress invited the French to send delegates to their second congress, but there were no takers. Shocking, right? So when the revolution broke out, the Patriots found themselves opposed to the French almost as much as they were opposed to the British. When Montreal surrendered, General James Murray was appointed governor of the new Quebec. There was an expectation on both sides of the Atlantic that he would begin the assimilation process of the French colonists living there. There was just one problem. There were 70,000 Roman Catholic French settlers and very few Protestant British settlers. So what do? The short answer continued to allow a lot of the French customs and laws despite the takeover to avoid a bloody insurrection. The British already had their hands full in the Great Lakes region and the Udawea region, best not stir something up along the St. Lawrence. This however didn't mean it was all smiles and rainbows for the Canadiens. The province of Quebec was ruled by a governor appointed by London who could call for an assembly if he wanted to, but since Roman Catholics were denied the right to vote, this meant that any elected assembly would represent only the tiny minority of Protestants and would therefore be a joke, and would also anger the French. The decision to continue to rule by fiat, in turn, angered the Protestants, who were accustomed to some degree of local representation. They were even more angry by the fact that Murray was allowing the Catholic Church to just, you know, be... I mean, look at it, standing over there being all Catholic. Disgusting. These triggered Protestants successfully cancelled Governor Murray and had him replaced by General Guy Carleton, after whom all things Carleton in eastern Ontario have been named, including the university in Ottawa with the second best architecture and the sketchiest underground tunnel system. Also, there is almost nothing at all on Guy Carleton on YouTube, which makes no sense since the name Carleton is so prevalent in Ottawa. You know, the capital of a G7 country. I mean, come on. The most viewed video on this platform is literally voiced by a child. Also, they pronounce his name as Guy, but he's from Irish descent, not French, so I'm going to pronounce it Guy. Wait, is that where South Park got its inspiration for making all Canadians call each other Guy and Buddy? Okay, let's get back on track here. While the Protestants initially hoped Carleton would side with them and assimilate the French, they were once again told to go to their safe space. Sir Guy Carleton realized that forced assimilation just wasn't going to work, and decided that he must woo the French into supporting the British crown instead. He traveled to London to successfully petition the passage of the Quebec Act 1774. Unlike the Patriots, who saw the re-establishment of French laws, customs, and religion as a front to their liberty, the French population in Quebec largely supported most of these measures. Groundbreaking research, I know. It should be noted, however, that Carleton wasn't as interested in convincing the poor, unwashed masses to like Britain as much as he was interested in convincing the church and the nobles, or seigneurs, to support Britain since they held all the real power. That was the thinking behind a decision to grant the church the power to enforce the collection of tithes and to issue binding spiritual edicts for the first time since the British takeover. 
these provisions weren't as well received by the Canadiens. Don't get me wrong, they wanted to be good Catholics, they just wanted the option of skipping the collection plate every now and again. Worse still was the law reimposed a lot of New France's semi-feudal order which denied commoners the right to own land directly. Instead, the land was owned by a lord who now had brand new authority to collect sans et rent, i.e. annual duties from the commoners. The lords also had the right to demand their workers provide a certain number of days labor to them for free. Kind of like how you don't get overtime pay for the first four hours you work over your 40 hour work week. This new system of not being allowed to directly own your own land scared the patriots for whom land was their livelihood. After all, they had earned that land fair and square by stealing it from Native Americans. In the end, Carlton had succeeded in gaining the loyalty of the church and the nobles, as well as the apathy of the general population. The way they saw it, it could be so much worse, even if the new law formally vested all legislative power in a new non-elected body that permanently crushed any hope of a representative democracy in Quebec. Despite gaining the loyalty of the church and nobles in Quebec, Carleton had succeeded in angering the already furious population in the 13 colonies. As for the future of Quebec, the land and government reforms Carleton ushered in would bring enormous changes to the colony after the U.S. gained its independence. But that's a story for another time. So when the American Revolution broke out, the habitants in Quebec had a choice. Stick with the British crown that was, at least right now, respecting a lot of their rights, or side with the revolutionaries who despised them and were hell-bent on rolling back their freedoms. In the end, whether through apathy, fear of the Americans, or thanks to the influence of the Catholic Church, the Canadiens declined to join the revolution. Despite the Continental Congress asking the Canadiens for help, Fewer than 1,000 people signed up for the opportunity to stick it to their British overlords. When Richard Montgomery and pre-traitorous Benedict Arnold, or I guess post-traitorous but pre-redemption Benedict Arnold if you're looking at it from the British perspective, either way, when the Americans invaded Quebec in 1775, they were able to take Montreal but were soundly defeated by Carleton at Quebec City thanks to a massive blizzard and some smallpox on the side. This saw some of the French who signed up for the revolution fight against the French militia who chose to side with the British. But ultimately, neither the ordinary folk nor the elites of Quebec would side with the Americans. And thus, the strange contradiction. France supported the revolutionaries as a proxy war to undermine the British Empire, but the French-speaking Canadiens of the recently lost French colony had more to lose by supporting those same revolutionaries than by sticking with the British Empire that had conquered them. Thank you guys so much for making it to the end. This was a rather long one. It's taken me two months to make this, so thank you so much for sticking to the end. As a treat, I have a little story I cut for time from the main video. The reason the British denied the Catholics the right to vote was because they were worried about the church using their faithful to elect puppets of the Pope. This fear of the Pope, using Roman Catholics to control foreign governments, was very widespread for many centuries afterwards and is still a fear among some today. For some reason. Okay, true story. Last year I witnessed a protest where people were accusing Trudeau of being a puppet of Pope Francis. Yes, in the 21st century. I'm not sure how that makes any sense, seeing how they differ on some very key issues, but there you go. To this day, there are some who continue to proudly support the stupid traditions of old. So be afraid of those who are different than you, I guess.